Morning, everyone. Hi, welcome to Tech About Our Live. Like I said, my name is Tamiwa. Uh, today, we're here to talk about cybersecurity in an event that is sponsored by Ava Security and Urban Ubuntu. Ava Security is a global tech company with offices in the UK, Norway, and the USA that uh, creates better and smarter ways to deliver security. Uh, Urban Ubuntu helps businesses deal with some of the biggest problems on the internet today by designing, developing, and implementing advanced encryption and network optimization technology. Uh, we're really happy to have them sponsoring today's event and supporting our work. And yeah, with us today, a few people who know quite a bit about uh, cybersecurity and how you protect your customers from cyber fraud. Uh, first of all is Adiolua Akomolafe. He's the Chief Information Security Officer at Wema Bank. Welcome, Adiolu. Thank you. Uh, everyone. Excellent. I'm going to ask you to please turn up your volume or move closer to your microphone just so that we can hear you. Okay. Is it better? Yes, I think that is better. Excellent. Okay. Also with us is Nick Maxwell. He's the general manager at Ava Security. Hi, Nick. Good morning, Tamir, and good morning, everybody. Good to have you here. Uh, we've also got Daniel Oshinaye, he's the co-founder and CTO at Evolve Credit. Hi, Daniel. Hi, hi to everyone. Um, nice to be here. Excellent. Um, and then Joseph Onyema is the Group Informa Chief Information Officer at United Capital uh, PLC. Hi, Joseph. Hi, everyone. Morning. Good morning. Good to have you with us. And last but most certainly not least, very happy to have her here today, is Sofina Kio Lawson as the co-founder of She Secures. Hi, Safina. Hi, Tamiwa. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Good to have you here today. Um, all right, so um, we're gonna get into uh, this conversation. Overall, in terms of the structure of today's conversation, um, I've just done some intros. Nick is going to do a, a short presentation, just under 10 minutes, talking a little bit about security from Ava Security's perspective. And then we're going to have um, a bit of a roundtable conversation with me asking some questions that we've prepared um, and some questions that the audience has submitted uh, ahead of time. That'll take about 40 minutes. Um, and then we'll do a general Q&A, sort of taking questions from the audience in the Q&A section. I think it should be an interesting conversation today. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we hope it's lively. We hope it's interesting. And we hope it is valuable. Nick, if I can ask you to talk to us a little bit about security from your perspective. That's yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you for that to me. So, um, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for, for taking the time out today to have a quick chat. So uh, as, uh, as Tamir mentioned, my name is Nick uh, Maxwell. I'm, I'm general manager for Ava um, uh, across the region. Um, and we're going to talk about a, a serious uh, concept right now. And it's not just a concept, it's reality all around how to protect personal data in regards to, um, to cyber fraud and kind of the, uh, the thesis around it and, and how we can potentially um, a, a address um, these risks that, that consistently and constantly um, expose us on, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Uh, and for those who don't know much about Ava Security, don't worry, I won't be offended. Uh, the purpose of this is obviously to give you a bit more of an insight in terms of who we are. Uh, we're about four or five years old. We're a technology innovation organization, but focused on driving cloud-based security more, but beyond uh, security in terms of um, understanding what we do around hybrid attacks um, with the convergence between physical and cyber security. But today, for the purpose of this conversation, uh, we'll focus purely on, on cyber fraud and, and, and how we see it uh, with our customers, with our partners, and, uh, and we focus on that. So... Let's look at the industry today. We, we collate the information. There's, there's a number of, of reports um, that happen every year, um, but every company is at risk in terms of a cyber attack. Actually, through the last 12 months, we've all, all been through the same um, issues economically, but actually it's been the highest rise in cybersecurity attacks that we've ever seen once before. Um, the scary thing about that is that actually over 90% of these attacked, uh, attacks included the human vector which is 10 times um, more than it ever was before. And the reason for that is purely around how the user is not, not necessarily the weakest link, but sometimes the, mon, uh, the most uneducated, the most um, uh, at risk uh, part of a component of security, uh, because we just don't enable them. 
solutions are out there. There's, there's uh, so many information security vendors out there for sure. And there's no such thing as a silver bullet. Uh, but ultimately, the, the goal here is to protect information, whether it's PII, whether it's IP, um, whether it's just pure data from a business to avoid any data breaches. But when we talk cyber fraud, phishing and the ability to actually um, focus in on the user to make uh, possible mistakes happens more and more on a daily basis. But why are we talking about this? What we've seen over the last 12 months is actually the, the, the perimeter boundaries have now changed. I personally have worked remotely from home uh, from many different locations across the world for the last 10, 12 years. That's never changed who I am as a security professional, but how has it affected people who aren't fully skilled up and knowledgeable around cyber criminals and what um, cyber security truly means? And more importantly, how do we better protect against that information? Uh, so the global pandemic has let, let, um, led a majority of companies down a path in which they've never had to deal with before. And um, we take uh, focus from reports from Interpol, for um, uh, EICPA, all, these, all this data is the fact that people cannot get away from the fact that we make mistakes. We are human. Um, we can't just rely on AI and, and technology and machine learning to make decisions. We need that human interaction. But how do we create that fine balance between human interaction and mitigate against the risks, uh, the risks around cyber fraud, people potentially changing data, getting access to data, understanding access to systems? Um, but how do we educate them that it's not the right thing to do? And this is where it happens, is the fact that the bad guys just aren't quarantined. Everyone's favorite word, we talked about quarantine and lockdowns and everything over the last 12 months, and we won't put a dampener on today. But actually, there's a lot of people who are focused on the external threats and the crisis and the fears around, what are people doing to try and get in? But what are we doing about the people that are already inside the boundaries, that are inside the perimeter, that have access to the data, and that have access to the systems? We need to focus on both. There's always been a large focus in terms of people pushing the boundaries and making sure that we're, we're driving toward that, uh, that natural state of defense in depth. But the physiological impact of the economy has driven us to actually expose ourselves as organizations, as enterprises to more risks. But how do we enable organizations and enable users to help us make better decisions so we don't, whether we have a distributed architecture or we've got a distributed security model that we can enable them to make those better decisions. It's not just about blocking or allowing. There needs to be somewhere in the middle. There needs to be a gray area. And there's a constant question in terms of how do we put that gray area in place? And this is from, from our perspective, this is our own analogy. And, and we, we genuinely believe that actually securing your organization starts with people. We need to understand the risks or in, in this case, discover them educate the employees, enforce the policies. You'd be surprised how many organizations that I speak to um, or that we speak to on a regular basis, not just whilst I've been at Ava in, my, in, in past history as well, and the IT usage policy is in place, but nobody adheres to it because they just want to do their job. And sometimes they have to cir uh, circumvent control. And ultimately the end goal here is to prevent data loss. So with our deep learning analogy, no pun intended, there is a, there is a need to obviously help the organization to, to go down that route and this is where we focus on there is there is uh, there is more of a need to focus on users when we talk around cyber fraud to have the ability to understand exactly what the user is doing to mitigate against them potentially manipulating data manipulating systems and ultimately pr uh, exposing organizations to this risk whether it's clicking on a link to a potential spear phishing or a phishing attack, whether it's actually exposing data to people who they uh, inadvertently thought was the actual customer and client that needed or, or required access to that data. But having the ability to actually identify and track the entities of interest doing this behavior is one of the key core concepts where forensics and analysis just isn't quite there and skilled up today, where we need to have the ability not just to protect in real time, but to retrospectively go and adhere to these policies. So as I mentioned before, and I won't talk too much onto this slide, these are the four components which we focus on. Uh, we want to focus on obviously education, enforcing the protection of the user, the data and the organization, but actually pretty much um, how we can go into this process. Thank you for the time and I'll, I'll hand back to Tamiwa. Thank you, Nick. I appreciate that. That was very, very useful. 
Um, so I didn't do full introductions for everyone uh, when we first spoke. So I think I'm gonna take a moment and do those and then we'll jump into the Q and A uh, with everyone. Uh, so Nick, who just spoke, is a cybersecurity and is a networking industry professional uh, with a passion for learning, working, and creating a better understanding of the concerns and needs of clients and partners across regions. Uh, he has over 13 years of experience in the technology industry and has worked at multinational leading technology companies um, as the GM for UK MEA and AFD at Ava Security. Uh, Nick continues to grow these regions with new partnerships. Um, by doing events like these and introducing the company, facing new challenges and enabling organizations to mitigate against both physical and cyber threats. Um, and we're gonna talk quite a bit about those today. Um, they use machine learning to detect and protect against threats um, across uh, both physical and cyber platforms. Joseph leads an innovative team at uh, Nigeria's fastest growing investment bank, United Capital. Um, they're transitioning from being a high network focused business to a retail uh, with total leverage on tech and digital transformation to drive uh, sort of their growth. Over the last year, he has helped United Capital to transition to 100% remote growth, remote work structure while improving services and automation, um, leading them to grow revenue 61% in 2020, which is no mean feat for 2020. I'm going to talk a lot about sort of that remote work and how it's affecting security, what kind of changes uh, you guys are seeing, what kind of new challenges you're facing, also how you're securing people with sort of um, people accessing information from so many different physical places. Like that's going to be part of today's conversation. Adi Olua is a skilled information security professional. He's had 20 years uh, in the industry and honed his expertise in some of the world's leading organizations from Barclays to Brown Shipley and the Brown Council. Uh, he's been at Weber Bank since 2016. As part of his role as Chief Information Security Officer, he's re responsible for developing and creating a comprehensive strategy to serve a big bank's sort of security needs. Um, he has a degree from uh, computer science from Obafemi Awolowo University, um, and a postgraduate degree from University of Manchester. Uh, Daniel is the co-founder and CTO at Evolve Credit, which is a load and financial products market space, marketplace. He is responsible for building the backend infrastructure, driving the product roadmap, leading the technical team, and driving company strategy. Uh, prior to that, he's been a web developer and a front-end engineer. Uh, he's presently a scholar of the MasterCard Foundation uh, and studying for a degree at American University of Beirut. And Sophina, I should actually have reversed the order and started with you first. Uh, as a cybersecurity professional, she currently works with leading financial services firms. She's also one of the co-founders of She Secures, which is a growing initiative that inspires and empowers young African women to pursue careers in digital and cybersecurity, uh, while also providing digital security literacy to both individuals and organizations. Uh, she's in previous years worked on providing both digital and holistic security support to marginalized communities and NGOs across Nigeria and Africa at large. Welcome, Sofina. Um, so I want to start with, I'm going to start with uh, Joseph, actually, and just ask about sort of this um, over the last few years, uh, over the last year, that transition to remote and what the impact has been in terms of how uh, you think about security, what's changed? Um, yeah, how has it changed? What are the new challenges and how are you guys managing them? Joseph? Yeah, so um, morning again. Um, I'll just quickly run through that. Um, transition is remote, um, came with a bit of a security challenge. I'm quite in different phase. Um, I would say, first of all, we then realized that our employees were more of a major risk than we actually thought they were. And the human factor to risk um, became pronounced where you have um, employees now with laptops at home um, and you had to lock up, basically, you had to deploy um, DLPs, device lock protection, to basically lock up. Um, loss of documents from any of your USB ports and documents that were going to go to the cloud. Um, you also have to change the level of security and lockout time on um, devices because quite a number of employees will say things like, I don't have power at home, right? So I have to work out of my friend's house and just leaving their laptop there for say five minutes and I need to run home to pick something. They leave their laptops unsecured. And that was a major uh, pain point for us uh, um, at some point. So we had to begin to turn out the entire security infrastructure that we had. Um, first of all, we're looking at how to connect people remotely to the office. Next, when we're done with that, we're looking at how to secure their devices when they were at home. And then in between all of those, um, we had uh, people connecting to the office and we're trying to say, okay, how secure um, are these connections? How many levels of authentication 
Do they need to have from the VPN to the internal solution? Um, how do we need to integrate this um, the VPN to the um, Active Directory and all of those um, bits put together? And then when we had that, it became a whole new thing about the customer end and security gaps um, around that end. So I would say it's a whole gamut of um, security challenges we had to face. The last of them then being physical security immediately within the office. Um, we did only that to say, okay, the office is an office, you can come in 24 hours a day, just walk in and then you can work. And then all of a sudden we realized someone could come in and just plug his own personal laptop into your network and just go pulling files. So we now had to begin to put things like a Mac to block the network internally that if you did plug in anything in the network, it deactivates that entire pipe and all of those. So the security gaps that we then noticed immediately went remote was one, we were leaving the office. So we had gaps in the office to begin with. Um, two people were now working remotely. You couldn't control where those devices were going. They were going to their friend's house to try to get power. Once again, we are in Nigeria. Um, they didn't have to fast power, so they were going to their friend's house to try to work. Uh, when it was time for lunch, they had to leave their laptops and try to run home and back. So you have to now start protecting those devices. And lastly, you have to protect um, traffic over the VPN from wherever they, it was they were to the solutions that they're trying to connect to in the office to work remotely. So those were yeah, um, the basic things we have dealt with in the last, say, one year, trying to close out gaps. Interesting, really interesting. Adio, can I ask, I mean, uh, for Webma, are you, are you facing roughly the same set of challenges? I mean, as a bank, um, what kind of changes did you have to make over the last year from a security perspective? Um, thanks for that. Well, I would say the same sort of challenges. Uh, you know, prior to COVID, really, it was uh, sort of unheard of that bankers would be working from home. You know, if anyone asked for uh, remote working, you basically just shut it down and say, sorry, you can. But well, the realities of the times then, uh, we had to find ways to keep the business running. But we also need to understand that to a large extent, uh, some form of remote work had been going on with 0365. You know, most organizations have been on Office 365 for a while. Uh, OneDrive, people have been using OneDrive, but maybe not extensively at an enterprise level. But what was important really was to now ensure secure access to internal applications, you know? So well, we've had the likes of VPNs and all that mentioned. Of course, you have to deploy all that to ensure that uh, people are coming to you from a secure channel. There is very little you can do about um, how people behave when they're in their own space. So we also had to drive a lot of um, awareness, you know, about the sort of risk that uh, exists in that space, you know, things around shoulder surfing, um, ensuring you lock your workstation where you're not um, at your workstation like you would do in the office. You know, when you start working from home, that becomes a part of the enterprise and you need to treat it like um, you're sat at your desk at work. So there was a lot of um, security awareness uh, drive that period and we kept sending out information. And of course, with examples of uh, uh, breaches we've seen happening because people are working remotely, because you really need to bring it on so they understand what the risks are. Because most business guys just want to do their job, just give me the tools to do my job. And they leave all the security to you to deal with. But that would happen where you were all internal in the office. But now that we've handed the office over to you and you've carried the office on with you, you need to become part of uh, the security staff, if I might, if I might use those uh, words. And that's where um, solutions like what was earlier uh, presented comes into play. You know, you need to now find more intelligent ways to secure these remote users. Because we can keep saying the user is the weakest link, but then you need to ensure that you've given them the uh, technology that reduces that risk. And really, a lot of user awareness is necessary. It never gets too, too much. You know, we've seen the sort of events happening globally. And it's a, it's a, it's a wider global world now. It's, it's all out there. 
every system is on the internet. Nothing is closed again. It's not a closed economy, well, except maybe in China, where everyone talks to everyone these days, you know? So that awareness was critical for us. Um, we had the infrastructure to ensure secure access, and uh, we still have applications. We do not allow people access remotely because of what they are. So again, you need to also understand your assets and categorize them in the right way. So you can uh, have different levels of uh, security implementation for those assets and different levels of access also to those um, critical assets you believe you have in your organization. I'll stop that for now. Thanks, Julian. Um, I'm gonna ask Sufina to come in and just talk about, so I think an interesting thing we've heard here is, uh, and this is a key security idea, is that the most vulnerable person, uh, the most vulnerable point is the individual. And so I'd like you to talk about sort of some best practices in terms of individuals, in terms of thinking about just security habits. So if your team's going remote, you know, five things they need to know, or what like things that your team needs to know in terms of like actually like being security intelligent, security aware. And then after that, we'll go to Nick for a technology perspective, but I think habits and individuals, it'd be great to hear your perspective, Safina. Yeah, uh, I think I'm also going to like follow with the same um, angle where Adiolo just mentioned, where that we, we shouldn't be putting all the pressure on the users or all, on the customers, or on the consumers themselves. So they should be able to like know that, okay, this product I'm about to use is way secure. I, I don't have to like channel all my energy into having to decide, oh, what kind of best practices do I have to do at every 247? Or oh, do I have to use a password for it? Do I have to like have like an active virus before I use my application? It should just be security by default. It should be like when you're designing stuff or when you're designing products and services, it should be that, oh, we're designing for the users to make them not be too reliant on having to use best practices. Because how many best practices are you going to have for the entire year? You're going to have like every single month have so many numerous best practices. Oh, I have to have a password for my before I before I make a transaction to my family. I have to have like a password manager to know remember all those passwords I have all over the or on my on my social media account. I have to have like an antivirus. I have to install it or upgrade it. But, like there's so many things. I I just wish that we wouldn't like put so much pressure on the consumers or the user because let's be honest. The, the best thing we can actually say is that, okay, yeah, as a designer or as a developer or as a UX researcher or anything, let's ensure that whatever we're doing, we're, we're not putting that much um, amount of pressure on them. We should just try to get our products out there and ensure that, okay, whatever the case is, the security and the privacy of the user comes first. Whatever we're doing, whatever best practices where we want them to follow, if it's having to ensure that, oh, I have to have like an antivirus on my on my application. Why do, why do you have to have like an application where you know that, okay, it's not very secure, but then at the end of the day, I have to like go and purchase an antivirus because my Apple or my, or my Android product isn't that safe or isn't that secure. I have to go an extra mile to do that. But we live in a very like sad reality where like, it's, it's now falling back to the user. At, at, at the end of the day, they still have to do whatever they have to do to protect themselves. They have to start changing their passwords every three months or every 90 days. They have to not use the same passwords over and over again, building a mechanism where you know that if they have repeated a password the previous month, they shouldn't repeat it the next time. You're having to de de devise a system where you know that, okay, when was the last time you changed your password? Have they, have they changed it regularly? Are they using password managers? With everybody moving up to a hybrid network or hybrid and um, working environment these days, you have to ensure that they have multi-factor authentication enabled as well. So one of the first thing you want to do when you're logging onto your devices or you're logging onto your phone. Sorry. Slow down just a <laughs> tad. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Sorry. So I was trying to say that um, with everybody having to move to like the whole virtual and hybrid working environment, we want to ensure that users are having like multi-factor authentication enabled for them. So when, when like what Joseph mentioned earlier, like somebody's going to have to like or maybe share it, share a system or a working space with their friends or to their family and their friends. And you want them that once they need, they need the five the five seconds they just stepped out, they should another person should come in and log into their system immediately. There should be like a whole logout as soon as you're done. Like in the blip of a second, I'm I'm totally locked up from my virtual environment. I don't have to have somebody else trying to get my password or trying or trying to guess oh what did they use or what kind of environment did they used to log in. It shouldn't even be known as well. So yeah, things like that. So, yeah, having like the whole environment, what they call it, the, the antiviruses, having to use password managers, having to use uh, uh, what they call it, them is a multi-factor authentication. That has, I think, that's one of the best things that people have actually advocated for when they say we're working from home. Having to ensure that users are like sharing details that they shouldn't be sharing. Having like a zero trust um, 
policies as well for your organizations. But when people are at home, the first thing they want to do is that they, are, they quickly want to check their emails. Oh, have I missed anything from the office? Have, do I have a, a new email from my manager? Do I have a new email from my boss or from my colleague? And they, they wouldn't even think twice before opening that email because the fear of missing out or fear of like, oh, I haven't responded or I haven't checked my email in the next couple of minutes. So yeah, having that zero trust and having like your, ensuring that your, your staff as well is like, or the users actually, you are going to be using it, the consumers themselves are like, oh, don't trust this or don't trust that. The whole phishing email and submission emails as well, having to like know before you leave, if you don't trust something, don't go for it. If you're not sure what kind of email, who the source of the email has been, you don't just open it or just spam, or change it to trash, move it to spam. And then Gmail and Yahoo and every other person, all of these mail platforms have made it like Outlook and everybody have made it easier for you to like report, fish, report um, phishing emails and they, they, they tell you that, oh, you, you know, you don't trust them, they report it or send it to your IT support team so that they can follow up on it and they can tell you, oh, if it's the wrong email or if it's not a, a very good source, but yeah. Well, at the same time, I'll still like right, reiterate my point where I said that we shouldn't be letting the, the users or the consumers, giving them those sorts of um, amount of pressure that we give and not be too reliant on having to do all these best practices themselves. Okay. Uh, uh, that was still very quick, but thank you. Um, Nick, I guess I've got, let me spin that question a little bit. Um, definitely, you gotta, um, we can't have the consumer bearing the full brunt of security issues. But definitely there is a uh, worker responsibility. Um, and then there's a technology angle to sort of like solving this sort of creative uh, security issues. So Nick, what's your perspective on that? Like what are the technology solutions? Um, how are you thinking about securing sort of like your team, your workers? So forget the consumer, like the people who are actually working within an organization and have access to the back end and your data and your internal systems and processes. You talked about that earlier, but if you speak yeah. a more to no, absolutely. So I think, I mean, first of all, for, for, for years, and it will continue to be as such, there's always going to be a fine line between security and collaboration. Uh, it's just become more prevalent over the last 12 months because we've had to expand and broaden our horizons a little bit as security professionals in terms of how do we address um, things like the, the network access in the perimeter. Not every, I mean, <laughs> there was, a, there was a, a constant stat thrown out earlier in the, um, the start of the pandemic and the fact that Cisco was actually the richest they've ever been because everybody needed a VPN. They not had one before. <laughs> so it was, from a vendor perspective, they're, they're great. However, that's not a tangible, futuristic response from a technological perspective in terms of how do we address that point. With having... The, a defense in depth approach to authentication, to, to data systems, to, to user centric behaviors, and having the ability to understand the user as an individual. And as, as Safina just mentioned, giving them the tools without having to have human interaction is ultimately the goal of every security vendor. And if it's not, then, then maybe it's probably worth reviewing kind of where that technology stack lies. Because ultimately it's to, to take, it's for the business and the security, the risk, the fraud individuals who, um, uh, my esteemed panelists and obviously people who are part of this call, bless you by the way, Tamiwa, um, <laughs> is um, the, the need to obviously have the, those conversations internally and go, what can we do better as an organization to ensure that our employees who do need the access, who, who do need access to this data, to these systems to effectively be better at their jobs, their roles, who aren't necessarily security professionals, we all have different specialisms. We have, all have different environments. Um, it, it's kind of one of the things that we have. We all use different OSs. Some have Macs, some have Windows, some have Linux. If you're, if you're a developer in this respect, I'm sure. I'm pretty sure Daniel probably uses either a Mac or a Linux machine. It's just this is the, the type of world that we live in. We, we utilize a BYOD environment. We have a hybrid environment. We need to be um, collaborative across all many different systems from a technological perspective. And it's not just a one size fits all. So as I mentioned, I take it kind of back to the, to the beginning of this is there is never going to be a one size fits all for any organization. We need to have the ability as, as, as vendors, as our own, to provide a better solution for ultimately to <laughs> make better decisions. Yeah. But also as part of that, there is always, if you take Pareto law, there is always going to be that 80-20 rule. If we can take 80% off the burden of the user and still leave that 20% gap where we might need their interaction some point and we give them the right security education awareness, then we're in a good spot. Fantastic, thank you. Daniel, let me ask, what's, um, what's the view like from your end? I mean, you're in the FinTech space, you guys are doing credit, you're doing loans. 
Uh, what's changed over the last sort of 12 to 15 months? Uh, what are your biggest worries from a, from a security perspective? Yeah, thank you, Tomo. And first, I just want to say um, I'm stoked to be here. I have like over 30 years of cybersecurity experience around on this panel. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Um, so for us, interestingly, um, since we started two years ago at Evolve, we've been remote first. So it was it was quite difficult to, to also relate with like the concerns around users, you know, employees and all of that. And our, our team is split between business and marketing and, and engineering. So space and alpha. We're, we're very small team as well. Um, in terms of security, um, we've so in context of what we do at Evolve, so we're an online marketplace, which means that a lot of people use our marketplace to look to, to sort for financial services like loans, insurance, and other services like that. Um, there, there, there are several layers. And so some of the most um, pressing concerns is in terms of identity and fraudulent transactions. So, I mean, when we started, we had a very serious case where because we've always been a market, marketplace in some form. And so we had merchants on one side of the business and we had um, general users on another side of the business where we're providing some sort of point of sale credits to people. And so we'd see that, you know, customers would come on the platform and, and sort of like go behind and meet their merchants. And also at that point, it had to be a situation of trust. It had to be a matter of trust where when a user goes to like meet a merchant and say, oh, you know, just just do this for me i'm gonna i'm gonna study that i'll pay both back the merchants come to us and be like oh see this person and then we're able to block them and you know just black piece for instance the billion and things like that and so in terms of um you know human interaction that that was a challenge at the time even now we now so now we provide um a full suite of like loan management system for some of our uh, business clients and some of the concerns also is we have to make sure that customers that come from the marketplace are properly identified because we're playing around with money here. And you know, we do when we send when we send um, leads, so when we process you know transactions to, to some of our some of our lenders on, on the platform and they use our platform to disperse money, they need to be sure that they give you money to the right, right people um, who are going to pay back, who are a right identity. Um, and so in most cases, what we've had to do has mostly been technical in terms of like verifying identity in terms of yeah, having like systems that just um, identify uh, uh, wrong identities, for instance, checking that your BBN is for you and it matches your bank account. Because if, you, if you're going to be fraudulent with a loan um, and you submit a BBN and you submit a bank account, if they don't match, then there's something there and just so, so we just make sure we blacklist that and check that manually and see what's going on around there. Um, other things, I'm just very paranoid. <laughs> I think I think I think a very important behavior around around you know building tech and building technology is just paranoia. Like when I'm when we're building a new feature with it, I'm just paranoid. I'm like what could go wrong, you know, and I try to encrypt everything that is sensitive, like BBNs actually. Um, you know, we try to encrypt everything that is sensitive, like BBNs, um, you know, sensitive, sensitive information, you know, passwords, of course, um, and things like that. So end-to-end -end encryption in, in some areas, not all areas, not full, uh, you know, full-blown encryption because that affects performance. But in general, we try to keep data as secure as possible. And, um, you know, we just, uh, you know, two-factor authentication. So some really general basic things that I think everyone should do. Um, yeah, and it was it was just funny to me because I just before this call I was looking at some I was reading an article and I saw that forty percent of organizations say their password in plain text and that was really baffling, but but I, I couldn't I couldn't yeah. relate to that and, and that's that's really baffling. I was I was stoked because I I'd, I'd never done that. I saw Facebook, Robin Hood, and like whoa, why <laughs> why would anybody do that? I mean nobody should see anybody else's password, and so that's something that. I never thought anybody would have ever done, but I mean, it exists. So it, it was, um, I think it's a big problem that I don't know why anybody should, I couldn't justify it for any reason, even for password reset purposes. There are other ways to solve these problems. Or, yeah, so um, I think I'm very paranoid. And I think everybody should if you're building tech <laughs> and um, you should just always look at, if you're building a new service or a new product, just keep looking at how could it be exploited 
and try to block it. I don't think we can solve it 100%. <laughs> we still get very, um, uh, we still get fraudulent people coming out from all the time because we're loans and yeah, but we just make sure to try as much as possible to block some of those um, kind of users in general. So I think, yeah, um, that that's... Okay. Thank you. So, I mean, I think there's an interesting thing you've touched on there, and I'm actually going to ask Adilua first and then Joseph to touch on sort of like, look, what are the biggest tips that CTOs and CIOs need to like secure? And what are the worst sort of errors that you see on a repeat basis on a security level? So obviously storing text, uh, storing passwords in plain text files is, is just brain dead security protocol management. Um, but as banks, as investments, sort of like organizations, I'm sure you're seeing a lot of the same kind of mistakes over and over again. So what are the big ones that you've seen? And what are the big tips in terms of people just tightening, tightening their security apparatus that you can, that you can tell us? Um, so if I get your question right, uh, it's top things that you feel people should do to improve their um, cyber security posture and the sort of things you see that people are not doing right. Is that the question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm trying not to get too technical. I'm not like I'm a very technical person. <laughs> Um, but really, one thing that is that is really critical um, in securing your infrastructure is to actually understand your infrastructure and know what your assets are. So that's the that's the foundation. Really, you need to know what your assets are um, before you can secure them. So what I see really um, is when you miss that foundation then you miss out on the things you need to secure. Then you start having gaps. So what is critical really is understand what your assets are. Then you now need to sort of do some, uh, if we're going to the business continuity risk management world, do some uh, business impact analysis to know how critical those assets are. Then secure those assets based on how critical they are to your business. So it's important you know what your assets are. You understand what's critical to your business, what drives your business. Because security really is, uh, what I say about security and in my role is, I give the business an opinion of um, what I feel based on some um, qualitative risk assessment that's been done. Now, the business might come back and say, yes, we agree with your opinion, but we still need to do business. Then you now start looking at the assets involved in that business that needs to be done. What sort of controls can I put in place to ensure they can still do the business, even though I've got these concerns? So for me, that bit is very, very, very critical for technology, for security. You need to understand your assets. You need to know what those assets are. You know, in security, we say it's about uh, people, processes, and technology. People could mean so many things, could mean your customers, uh, could mean your internal staff, could mean do you have the right resources to do the job you expect them to do? Right? Have you employed the right set of people? And really what the pandemic has shown us, not even the pandemic, in the last three, four, five years, the world has really opened up. I've seen a lot of people get jobs outside of Nigeria, from Nigeria. And really what sort of conversation do you want to have with that person in Nigeria to say, do not leave, you know? So we've, we, we're in a situation where we're struggling for talents to do the job we need them to do. So you need to have the right set of people, right? When you have the right set of people, you need to have the right sort of processes in place, you know, that drive whatever it is you want to drive your security uh, program and all that. Then you look at your technology, you have the right technology to drive this. When you have those three tied together properly, then you can now start building 
and maturing your program. The, the luck that most financial institutions have really is that um, the last five, 10 years, maybe, there's been a lot of drive to uh, improve maturity on a lot of global standards. You know, ISO 27001, you need to be PCI compliant and all that. So a lot of best practices have been put in place. Now, to now mature those best practices and those standards is where we need these other things that are critical to understand. And like I said, for me, uh, if you ask me what my, what my biggest concern is, outside of the people, my biggest concern is visibility. Do I know exactly everything that I've got out there, right? Do I know what technology is doing? Are they introducing new products that I am not aware of, right? Are we putting new assets on the infrastructure that I'm not seeing? So for me, understanding what your asset is and where they are is very, very, very critical for, for tech. Understand your assets, right? Have the right set of processes or uh, programs to drive both your security and your technology program. Have the right set of people. What do I see that um, that is going wrong? Not going wrong, really. What's the, what's the other headache that people have, right? Um, I'll go to my evil friend, it's the third parties that we connect with. So I can secure my yeah. infrastructure to the tilt, right? But I connect with a third party that does not practice security at the same level that I practice security. And your weakest, uh, your, what's the, what's the statement again? Um, you are secure as your weakest link, okay? So third party integration has become a major concern. And again, back to visibility, you also need to understand who those third parties are, what exactly they're into, how they connect to you, you know, what sort of controls you have to put in place for those connections. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you. Um, let me ask uh, Joseph, so I, I mean, it's reported that nine in 10 data breaches are caused by employee mistakes. Uh, what kind of stuff do you guys do to mitigate the risk of human error and sort of the lack of understanding of security implications uh, from your employees? Okay, so, so the way I see it, um, from employee, you say from employee mistakes now, um, that brings in quite a number of dimensions into um, the pool. Now it depends on the kinds of kind of business um, one is handling. Um, I'll start from the basic building of an application. Um, I, I started off as a de developer um, up until this point. Um, and then you get to see that from the point of building the app already, if there are mistakes in how um, data is stored, you already begin to have issues, right? Um, to the point of the kind of data entries you have, um, how you ensure that you really have clean data within your system and all of that. And when I look at it from my own business point of view, once again, um, looking at what's critical to my own business, in my own case, I have five companies, um, I'm, six companies I'm handling more or less because one of them is new, more or less, um, like um, Daniel said, a loan business, right? And that end um, runs basically on basically the web and on USSD minimal human interaction, fully automated. But it's totally different from my securities trading end, where basically everything I do is equities trading, stocks moving in and out, the pipe, um, and how all of those data come back into my own system. So if my developers already have a mistake made from the way that they log this data, say they store passwords in clear text, um, that's, that's unique, um, without encryption, then already from the beginning, if anybody breaches that database, you already have every customer's passwords in clear text. It's as simple as that, as simple as that. Now, if I took out my securities business and looked at my investment banking business, where as opposed to the B2C kind of model, they are more a B2B, and the most important collaterals to them are documents, are intellectual properties, 
Once again, their filing systems, the way that those systems are filed within the databases, um, making a mistake in or cataloging or, or in defining the level of um, visibility of those files or level of importance of those files. If you define them wrongly from the onset, then my DLP, my device log protection will allow those files out of the network. So depending on how you define a, a, a file, if I define, define the set of files as internal use only, and an employee attached them to email and try to send them out, they will be blocked, right? My system blocks them. But if you define right. them wrongly as public use or um, say just confidential, they will go out of the network, but they might just not allow somebody else to push it, but they will leave the network. So once again, to a great extent, for each business, it depends on how, um, like, uh, and was it, you have to look at your own structure, say, how does, what, is my, what are my critical assets? How do they pan out for me? And then you try to play um, in and about um, all of those things. And the last bit I will touch on is the part where you said partnerships. Once again, if you are, because one of the things that drove numbers for us and that is driving numbers now is partnerships, right? How they structure those data, how those data comes to you. So you are having data that you are not serializing and that data comes to you, allow somebody to tear into your own system, tear you from online. Um, you have a man in the middle attack, you have um, all sorts of attacks that, that you get to get. And the reason is simply because to some extent you can protect your own end, but you can't protect your partner's end. So you want to be sure that what kinds of partners do I have? What level of NDAs have I signed out? And um, these things are not just all of around securities, but also around the legal framework you've created to try to mitigate those security issues. To say, okay, if these things also crystallize, this is how I get to protect myself, right? And then this is how fast I can cut off a partner if I realize I'm getting bad traffic from you. I can deactivate these API endpoints and say all partners on this server just go off while I continue to run my business until I can get the partner to mitigate and close out those gaps and then I turn on those partnerships again. So. To a great extent, um, all of these things um, matter to um, a great point. Lastly, for those that use the web, please, uh, if you just need to run um, pen tests continuously, vulnerability tests continuously, because these days we have developers design, even my young developers here design, and then when you get one of the big force to come run a vulnerability penetration test, you begin to see gaps within those codes, and that becomes a, a major problem that one needs to close um, virtually almost immediately. Gotcha. Thanks, Joseph. Let me jump, uh, Nick. So traditional controls like data loss prevention or your privileged access management and other point solutions have proven insufficient in preventing malicious activity like data theft and fraud. Um, what's your sense about sort of like the correct, strat the correct strategy for IT executives um, to protect cust customers against like data theft and fraud with their data? Uh, it's a fantastic question. It's actually one of the reasons why why I joined Avo is um, <clears throat> there was a, there's a huge frustration, right? There's there's so many technologies in the market, and where do we start? Do we start at the endpoint. Uh, to Joseph's point, do we start on the network? Do we start at the data layer? Um, and then it's the, the ultimate goal here is, is ultimately to protect the data. That there is no doubt about that. There's no deviation. The ultimate goal is to protect data. That's what everybody is trying to get to. I mean, data is the new oil or the new gold or whatever analogy that people want to use. And the, the one of the things is where we look at existing technologies, it's quite binary. Um, interesting that obviously we're speaking about binary and we're talking about development of solutions, but it, it's great. It's the fact that it's it's one or the other or the other. Why can't each technology speak to each technology? Why can't the data speak to the user? The user speak to the system, the system speak to all three. And this is a gap where actually what we do here is we have an ecosystem of technologies that we claim SDKs and EP, um, APIs and, and REST okay. APIs and open APIs. And it's, it's, it's all well and good and it's fantastic. Uh, it enables growth and economic scale when it comes to different technologies to actually enable security by design. However, what's wrong with building from the ground up that security by design where actually a solution that can speak to the user and actually understand how the user's interacting on a daily basis. I, I personally open the same applications on a daily basis and utilize the same things and still open Outlook on a thick client and also use Outlook on a personal level as well. So obviously same person because we incorporate a BYOD model, et cetera, et cetera. But then I imagine Daniel um, or Safina probably uses totally different applications. But again, geographically, regionally, individually, we need to understand how users interact and this is where kind of 
the whole concept of machine learning or supervised machine learning actually has the ability to look at these things, which every technology and every vendor is his favorite buzzword when we talk kind of deep learning and ML. But from a security perspective, and we talk and, and to the, the, the deprecation of, of, of legacy solutions in the market is they didn't they didn't uh, develop or build from the ground up by design. What they did is they acquired different technologies. You, you look at a lot of the existing vendors, the bigger vendors in the market, right? They didn't develop these solutions. They went and bought smaller guys and tried to amalgamate them and integrate them into their product security portfolio, which in on a high level seems fantastic. Um, on a low level, when we get into the weeds um, at a technical detail, it becomes overly complex from an infrastructure perspective, from a management overhead perspective, a lot of SDKs, a lot of scripts, which again exposes us to more risk. And, and this is where there, it goes back to the original point. And you asked me kind of why, where, where is the gaps? And why are there gaps? The gaps are, well, why is it that the technology is originally only focused on specific areas? And then where do we actually start? I mean, it's an interesting question. Maybe it's, um, it's a question for, um, for, for the security professionals, maybe it's something for the panel, is where do people genuinely start? Is it the endpoint? Is it the network layer? Because actually over the last 12 months, the network layer has become a little bit more, well, less effective, right? Because we've needed to open that access. So how do we still ensure from an authentication perspective that the user is who they say they are? How do we ensure that from an access management perspective, they're actually using the data or the applications they say they would uh, without kind of adhering or, or being preventative to to the collaboration or the user's workflow. So I think long, um, in answer to your, your question, I think there is there is a huge need for organizations, for, for vendors. If there's any, any um, and Daniel will probably know this from, from a development perspective is, if there's any new solution being built, it needs to cover all forms. It can't just be the user or the system or the data. We need to amalgamate all three and have the, the visibility of where that access where those systems interaction which dns we're connecting to etc cetera, etc cetera, fully visible and have the ability to correlate and aggregate such activities so then we can prevent in real time and retrospectively look at cyber fraud to ultimately protect against that data in the ip fantastic thanks Nick. let me push it to daniel because you've actually like you've kind of brought in some of the kind of concerns he'd have um, looking at his customers data um Daniel, I mean, so where do you start thinking about security? Uh, two questions. What, at what layer do you start? Are you thinking primarily from sort of the consumer layer, the network layer? Um, uh, that's question number one. And then question number two is, what are the kinds of sort of like fraud attempts or, you know, like data theft attempts that you see most frequently, Daniel? Yeah, thank you, Samuel. Um, so in terms of how we build the system, I can't really... I can't really say we start from like <laughs> one perspective because I'll tell you, I'll tell you. So the way it works in general is say, okay, we want to build a new product or when we're starting out, it's like, how do you build a product? You think about the problem you're trying to solve first, right? Think about the users, so like design interfaces, but at that point, so I can say at the point where you're just designing interfaces, when you, when you need to do two factor authentication, that comes in there. If you need to, you know, share information with the user in some way. Maybe you need to block out. Um, you need to block out sensitive information in some way. For instance, if you look at most platforms now, where people share card details, for instance, you don't you don't ever display. Um, you know, the entire. You just display like the, the last four digits and things like that. So, from a user um, experience perspective, I think it starts there. I'd say. Um, and then you didn't, because that's where you start building your product. And then you then move into like, okay, how do you design your infrastructure to serve that purpose of how the user interacts with the, the software that you're trying to build? And so, and so I think, I think when you, in terms of thinking about how you want to secure or how you want your system to work, you really start from the user's perspective on what happens in terms of like, okay, also in the startup, your perspective that we're serving lots of people in marketplace, we're serving uh, businesses on the other side. Um, so user experience, that, that's the first thing. And then when you, when you think about how you wanna solve that using technology, so your backend infrastructure, how you store data, how you structure, then everything flows to that, to that point. And then what you then want to be concerned about then is how do you secure it? How do you get access to, how do you prevent access 
how do you restrict access to that data? Or, you know, if somebody, so we now have APIs for, you know, partners, cause we want to scale like um, United Capital. <laughs> um, so we now, we now, <laughs> we, we now have access, <laughs> exactly, thank you, Torora, yeah. So we now, we now open up APIs and like, we now start thinking now that's a new concern, like, okay, how do we restrict um, how do we make sure we control access to these things in, in very intelligent ways, um, you know, even securing data. So one thing, one very interesting thing that I saw, because we, we use Heroku as a, you know, as a cloud provider. And what okay. they do at Heroku is um, actually, if you host your database on Heroku, um, they provide a service that allow you to so control access to this databases. So what it means is, you don't have just one access. The access to your database changes over time. So you just, you get access to a new key at interval, say every every 24 hours, every 48 hours, depending on what you want. So you can, so it's like, if somebody gets access to your login, to your database um, password and username and all of that, um, you can easily deactivate it, or it can even automatically be deactivated before they're able to cause, you know, too much harm and things like that. And so I think that's a very interesting, um, you know, approach to even data security. Okay. Um, so in, in a nutshell for you, for, for, yeah. No, I, that, yeah, um, in a nutshell. Yeah, finish up, yeah. Yeah, so for the first question, I think you think about, we think about the product from like uh, the user experience perspective, even if it's APIs, and then we come back and say, in, in, a, in trying to solve, in trying to make our users have this kind of experience, how do we need to design our system? What are the loopholes with this kind of experience? And then we try to build, build up from that. Um, going to the second question, fraud. <laughs> it's, so I think the long and short of, of the kind of challenges we have is identity, right? People try so many things. So also it's a marketplace for financial services. We're the first of that kind. And it's difficult to find articles that say, oh, if you're running a marketplace in Nigeria, where the quite a good number of people that want to exploit that thing, this is what you do. So it, it's difficult. But um, like I said, the first one we had was like, people would start going back to our merchants because the initial service service we were rendering was like a points of sale payment, credit payment system. And so people would go behind and be like, hey, you know, and we had to also incentivize the merchants to say that, okay, please, when you see things like this, we want you to make more sales. When you see things like this, please talk to us so that we can, you know, handle, handle it properly. Um, also, you know, Identity in general. So things like, like I said initially, when I, when I, you know, my first, uh, com the first comments I made is like, we, we, we're just very concerned about like, if, if something does not match, if it doesn't make sense, you know, if your data, if, if the history of your data does not make sense, if you have your name and it doesn't match your PBN, if you come and, you know, you, so identity you, theft, you know, that's the, that's, that's like identity, yeah. identity is like a, the primary concern for us. And also, also, I think it's part of our responsibility is um, keeping our customers' data safe, people that are actually true, you know, like their BVNs, well, like so card their details, you know, well, like all, yeah, things like that. Yeah. So Fantastic. we try to yeah. just Yeah. Um, Adiolo, I think you've got some context on this as well. Fraud is an area that you guys are really concerned with. Uh, so what are the risk points you see? Um, well, well, talking about fraud, we, we live and uh, break fraud in the financial sector, really. And um, what we see these days, really, it starts with your identity. When you lose that identity, and it could be anything, it could be what you have, it could be your phone. Um, and really, that's what is predominant in our space these days, uh, same swap fraud, um, same cloning. And, you know, most banks these days uh, run transactions via USSD. Uh, the minute you have the person's phone, you can find out if they have a bank account with certain banks. If they're using a pin that is not so secure, you know, there's several ways they fraudster would uh, gain access, but it starts with identity. And that's where um, there's a buzzword, it's been around for a while, 
uh, but it's where people are moving to now, which is zero trust and passwordless, right? Okay. When you're saying you're moving from the traditional network security model, which is uh, like they call it a trust, but verified. You know, I understand you've got this system within my network. I trust it. It's sitting on my infrastructure. All I need to do is just verify you're the person logging onto it. But now that traditional perimeter has been stripped away. It's not there anymore, you know? So you now need to look at um, zero trust, where you're saying that, look, I need everybody, user, um, system, even applications they're running to be validated before they can do things on my infrastructure, right? I don't want you to type in a password. Okay. I want you to call me. I mean, that's interesting, but what are the, so, but what's the cost of no trust? You know, so what is the cost in terms of sort of extra steps in terms of actually like getting things done? What is the cost? in terms of extra infrastructure uh, to, to, to verify at every single point. So what, what kind of- Well, you're not, you're not necessarily verifying at every single point. So okay. you still have the sort of concept of a uh, single sign-on. But what you're saying is, I'm using something at your first entry that tells me it has to be you, you know? Your sort of identity verification that you're using, you know, you are verifying the device that the person is using to log on. You're verifying where that person is logging on from. You okay. know, so things like, for example, a simple one like geolocation. I complete a transaction in Lagos at 10 p.m. and I'm seeing another transaction in California two hours after. It's not possible, you know. And we have technologies today that allow you to do that. And those technologies are being improved on considering the current realities. You know? Okay. Yeah. I mean, as a, as a, as a regular VPN user, um, I tend to start in Portugal, finish the transaction in South Africa, and then uh, continue it in Spain. But actually, I find that I get security on everything. Like that. And Amazon Prime would probably stop you from using yeah. a VPN called uh, device on their network. Yeah. You um, know. <laughs> let me bring Sophina on. I want to talk about sort of like the balance between privacy and security. You know, where's that line? And as a security person, how do you think about it? Like, you know, keeping people's data secure, um, but then not asking too much of them from a privacy perspective. Uh, what's the trade off there? Sophina. Uh, as a user, you, you, you sometimes have to be able to like give up one. Either you're choosing to be like, oh, I'm very comfortable using this product because the interface looks very nice. It's like very easy to use. Or I'm giving away the fact that, okay, I know they're going to share my data to maybe a third party or something. It's like, there's always this, it's never like a 50-50 thing where you're like, okay, it's 100% going to be um, having like security and it's 100% going to be like, oh, my privacy is is it something we're still like sort of battling, we're still trying to ensure that people, or people who are developing this product, people who are developing like um, Daniel, for instance, if he's building like his um, application for the, the loan application, you want users to be able to know that, okay, I'm putting all my PI, my personal information, my address, my, my date of birth, my everything up on your app. How am I sure that you're not going to give it to Joseph tomorrow and say that, okay, Joseph, these are people who have signed up on our, these are people who have signed up on our apps. These are, these are the loans they want to request for using whatever you want to do, just do with it. So, well, we know that yes, Danny has a very good interface. He has like he, he provides comfort to me because I can easily go and like, get my loan within like a very short period of time and everything. But then just like he's trying to say, oh, I'm trying to raise like the customers, I'm trying to get my user database to like one million users by next year or something. But how do you how do we fit in? How do we come, how do we, how do we create like a whole balance and a whole rapport and make this thing work? So as, as a user, I don't know that is what's going on. I, I don't know that this is a conversation that Daniel and Joseph might be having. I just have to trust that Daniel is going to protect my name and protect my identity and just give me what I want, which is to get a loan and ensure that he doesn't share or trade yeah. those, uh, what do you call it, trade those data with another person or sell it. But at the same time, I, I, would, I would encourage that the technologists should be able to like have, have the user or give the, give the power to the user where that they are able to 
control that data whenever they want to. So if I come up to Daniel and say, okay, I don't want my data on your platform anymore. I would like you to delete it in the next, let's say 30 days or, or send it to me over email or something. But after the next 30 days, I don't want it to be hosted on your application anymore. I should be able to have that power if I want to and not hear stories that, oh, we can't do that. Or we have social GDPR laws that says we cannot do certain things or this has been, <laughs> this has been blocked. So as a user, I still want to be able to feel like in control of my data. I still want to be able to feel like my data is not going to be used, abused in a certain way. I want to be able to know that I can use it an application and say that, okay, yeah, it's secure. It's very usable, it's user-friendly, it's everything. But at the same time, not just say that I'm giving it away to any other person who the highest bidder probably who wants to buy it for some thousands of dollars or anything. Just, it, it's a very, very dicey and very slippery slope right now where you're like, you're just going to be able to choose what you want. If you're going to be using Facebook, or you're going to be using WhatsApp. Are you are you giving away like, okay, I want to use it based on the fact that it's, everybody has access to it. Or am I going to be using Signal because I want to use Signal Messenger because I know that it provides me security and it provides me privacy. Or are you going to be like, oh, all my friends are on WhatsApp. Let me go to WhatsApp because the, everybody's using it. It's like very accessible. It's friendly. It's everything. It's been known for like the past couple of 10, a decade over now. And everybody knows that it's, it's going to, more than a decade, rather, sorry. Everybody knows that that's where you are. But if you're saying, oh, I want, to, I want to share something very private and there's encryption and there is like, I can ret retract my messages. I can send like a, a message and I can delete it within 30 seconds. So having this whole op option of like encrypting messages, having like a whole um, sending a message and you're able to like delete it within 30 seconds on Telegram or on, on Signal Messenger, you can be thinking about all those traders and be like, do I really want to be on this other place? that like, give me comfort. But then at the same time, my data will be, if somebody asks for a warrant and say, oh, let's see all the people who you've had a chat with in the past one year i'm able to provide that provide it to anybody that asks for that um, particular data it's 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 like okay it, it depends on the user really do you want to be able to have that power or do you want to be able to like oh yeah i'm okay i don't mind my data being transmitted or being transferred or being sold i i i really don't care as long as i'm able to my, send my messages as long as i'm able to use this application as long as i'm able to do whatever i want to do in the comfort of my home i'm, I'm good i'm fine or People who just prefer to like, oh, I'm very paranoid, I can't do this. So I'm just going to stick to what I know, where I know that my data is being used, or where I know I can always ask my data back or ask, okay, yeah, next two days, I, I don't want my data to be on Daniel's app anymore. Let, let's just delete everything and we're good to go. So yeah, it's it's really, really boils down to the user if you're okay with it and if you really want to, uh, sorry, and yeah, if you really want to just go with that route and go for it. Okay. I mean, I got to say, as a user, the GDPR, NDPR, like all of these regulations have created this horrible thing where every website asks for these permissions to like do, you know, accept all of these cookies or customize them. And I'm not customizing them for every website. And so generally, I'm just accepting it. So they actually haven't solved any problem because now they ask for my permission to do all kinds of things. And again, like the old Apple uh, bill of whatever it is that you have to accept before you install any Apple software. You just end up saying yes, because you're not well, going to read. That once you, read 50 if, pages. If, if you do if accept it, that means you know that you can actually, you're, you're giving away your control, you're giving away your power. You can't sue them anymore next or next year and say that, oh, you actually misused my, my data, because now you've actually- well, you can't use the product otherwise. So <laughs> I, it's just, so with, from a convenience perspective, it's an impossible sort of like uh, trade-off. Let me ask Nick to speak about this. I mean, like, so GDPR, NDPR, CCA, all the various regulations. I mean, what's your perspective in terms of like balancing that against like, um, so the privacy versus the, uh, the requirements for data management and then the reality of customers ability to like actually digest and make rational choices in the face of all this information. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, we've seen the convergence, right? Um, yeah. over the last 10 years uh, between yeah. security and privacy. Um, the more stuff with, uh, with, with Apple, with, with Facebook, uh, obviously the lawsuits that are going on globally, it's kind of consumers as people just, just want to get access to stuff. They just want to be able to do the things. They want to go on social media, want to use the apps that they want to use. Um, and sometimes don't really take consideration into the facts of what they're actually agreeing to. We all do, right? I mean, I've, I've got an iPhone, right? When I sign up, who who honestly reads through the EULA before? <laughs> it's fifty pages. <laughs> exactly. There was a there was a there was a meme not so long ago when Apple probably a turn of like the twenty first century is about that. Actually, 
uh, when if you get down to page 40, all it says is we've stopped writing now because you've not read this. <laughs> Nobody ever does. And that and that is the reality of the situation. Um, yeah. However, professionals like ourselves who work in security and work in privacy and work in risk and work in cyber, and it's we get it, we understand it, and then it's uh, it's kind of our jobs to be champions in that respect and educate the people around us. Um, but also because of the, I mean, if you if you look in the US, it's a very litigious state. Um, they're very much open to kind of being able to open to different things, and and they've kind of leapfrogged on the back of it and gone, absolutely, we're going to take some privacy and very seriously because we want to jump on the back of it if somebody misuses our data and we want to be able to get some form of compensation at the back of it however that's not the purpose of this right the whole purpose is to protect the consumer protect uh the individual um and what they necessarily they need to to address so if, in theory the the gdprs the then gdpr is just the, the ccpas the pop ears of the world a, a, a needs to have right they must have them in terms of privacy but when we talk data management, we f we fail um, because of the, the security and the solutions out there to actually incorporate it effectively to date, um, as effective as it should be maturity, uh, maturity wise. Can there be steps in place to put that in place? Absolutely. We talked about categorization throughout this conversation today. Uh, we've talked about the need to obviously protect the data, identify the data. Um, but how do we actually categorize that data? There's no global standard to it. We have global yeah. frameworks that are off the back of it, but we also don't have the ability to identify the assets as a global basis. It says, right, if it's labeled um, confidential, what's the difference between confidential and secret? And then yeah. what's the difference between highly confidential and confidential? There's too many different analogies in terms where people actually understand at the data level and actually retrospectively fit that to privacy mandates. There's a very fine line, but then on the back of it is when we have done that, how do, we, how do we then control who gets access to that data? We've got, um, we've got esteemed data protection officers on, on, on the panel, right? They, these guys obviously focus on what, what they do. We look at all the financials, but how do you create data custodians within your business, effective ones within that? Because it's not for us as IT professionals to determine what is HR data or what is marketing IP. That's for those departments to do that. But in, in that remit, in that world, they don't they don't they're not they don't care they're, they're not too bothered we've got to incorporate them within that so it's 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 a fine balance um but the the privacy security thing i think it will be an ongoing battle for the foreseeable okay gotcha i'm going to jump into the questions from the audience there's actually uh, a bunch of really interesting ones um so i'm going to start uh, there's a question from mike namdi and this is for sofina uh yes there's a need to reduce the pressure of security from users uh, but do you think it's possible to totally exonerate users of their responsibilities in terms of security? So, Sabina. No, uh, absolutely not. Um, the idea is just like what um, um, Nick said earlier, the 80-20 thing where like we, we want the burden to be on us as technology professionals or as security professionals to have like the bulk of it, having to ensure that users don't have to rely so much on it. But the 20% of the time is to see that, okay, how are you helping those users stay safe? How are you making sure that they actually can't do it. So if you're going to be sharing, let's say, a tip, I know some banks usually send like a whole notification on how security awareness, don't click on phishing emails or tell us when you have to do this or tell us when you call this number if you see that you feel like you've been hacked or you feel like some certain transactions are not like properly done or you feel like you use a cyber fraud on your account or something like just being engage, engaging or having that whole like uh, opportunity of communication line open and the fact that users can actually do that and having like whole uh, authentication mechanisms in place as well. So you're not ensuring, you're not making sure that people's passwords are in plain text. Like Daniel had said earlier, you're ensuring that your passwords have been encrypted totally with like RSAs or anything that you're going to be using. And like host, what they call it, defense mechanisms, ensuring that if, if they're going to be typing a password or setting up their accounts, making sure that they know that they have to choose like maybe it's 10 to 16 characters and all those like basic things that people can actually do that it's like very pretty straightforward. So we're not saying that we have to rely, like the users don't have any role to play. They definitely have a role to play. I mean, it's their money, it's their accounts. It's, they, they don't want their money to get lost either way. So making it very usable for them, user-friendly and making it very like easy for them to either set up their passwords or set up their accounts securely is actually the goal without like having this whole 10 to 20 rules for them to like try to remember at all times when they have to use your platform or use your use your services. All right, thank you. Um, 
from Mike Namdi, and I think this is a question for Adil Lua, which is, what do you use as milestones for categorizing the criticality of your assets? So. Well, like um, Mid just mentioned, it's down to, um, you need to engage the, the business. So the different business areas and the assets are, uh, um, have different impacts to the business, okay? So I'll give a typical example, just a link between technology and business. So the most critical technology asset in a bank today would probably be the core banking application, right? Now you can now say that every other thing that interacts with the core banking application to make it do what it's meant to do falls into that same space of criticality. So your firewalls, your um, API uh, management box that talks to the uh, core banking application. So you can categorize it in different ways. There are also business applications that might come into that fold. So you go to treasury, for example, you look at the business, what's the impact or the volume of this business to the bank's bottom line? Because really at the end of the day, it's all about numbers. It's about naira and cover or dollars or cents or whatever you want to call it. The bank wants to make money. So if this bit of business is generating those funds for that bank, what are they using to drive that business? That puts that infrastructure or that application into a bucket due to business needs. Because of security, certain things would be critical for security. Certain things would be critical for technology. So you basically need to um, have a sit down and a conversation with each business area to be able to do a proper classification of all your assets and even your processes. Gotcha. Fantastic, thank you. Um, here is a soft one for Nick. What applications would be recommended for security for back-end engineers who work remotely? Oh, that, see, that's open-ended. That's uh, You're leading me down a rabbit hole. <laughs> I mean, again, it goes back to the point is, where's the risk? Where's the risk that you're okay. even having this conversation in, in the first instant, right? Because typically yeah. when we're asking this question, something's happened. Um, yeah. Has a system malfunctioned? Has some infrastructure fallen over? Has some data been lost? Has, has yeah. a user compromised an account? Um, many different solutions to many different remits and responsibilities um but again it's we talk about defense in depth as best practice uh your developers your back-end engineers are your most technically savvy so have the keys to the kingdom but you also can't prevent them having the keys to the kingdom because they're the most effective they're, they're the people who who need that access so all i can suggest is be be conscious of which technology you're um you're selecting to obviously adhere to that risk or address that risk to not prevent them in their workflow um, and ensure that you're obviously getting maximum coverage um, from the different technology. I think a lot of new solutions that are coming out in the market, everyone's calling it next generation, cover a large amount of the landscape and the different components. Um, we don't need to have um, five, six, seven, eight different agents on the endpoint to protect it these days. You can have two or three. Uh, you'd be surprised how many organizations I speak to. I want I spoke to a multinational bank most recently and they had nine security agents on their endpoint because we we go through the band-aid approach and we we just put a plaster over it just because something's happened um we can we can address that we want to consolidate while still not having to compromise on the security posture of an organization and that's just not on an endpoint level that's at every layer layer that's that, that's needed so I hope that's given some advice. Um, but yeah, I, I can't, can't did, without understanding the risk, I, I wouldn't be able to point you in a direction. And I'd probably take Joseph or, or everybody else's lead in terms of what their approach has been in that respect, because I'm a little bit biased coming from a vendor perspective. Just, just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me ask uh, Daniel to take this. Um, we've got a lot of young people in our audience um, and someone's like, I'm about to start my career. I want to go into information security. What are the requirements necessary for me to kickstart my career? What do I need to focus on? What area of information security is more the future? Uh, actually, so I'm going to have, well, maybe Nick and Daniel take this actually. Just, yeah. Uh, so people who are trying to get into the career, like what's, yeah. Right. 
Thanks so much. So actually, interestingly, I saw Adeluwa post a, a job opening in the Bank. So maybe you should go intern with Adeluwa, I'd say. So I mean, this is... This <laughs> 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 so I'd say, I mean, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I'd say, I'd say, um, you know, find him on LinkedIn, send him a direct message. I mean, that I'd say you should do that first. But um, I, I think it would be a little difficult. Uh, okay, I don't know because I'm not specifically in the information security space. I'm, I'm a software engineer, but um, in general, when you want to do anything. Um, Personally, for me, I just started learning how to do it. Like I was in school, I wanted to learn, I wanted to do stuff. It's like just go online, right? Find find information. I'm, I think the most important resource that we have, like the most valuable resource we have now, is the internet because it gives you access to everything you need, like information you need to learn things. So before you actually before you message Adiola, go search online, know a lot of things about what you need to know, you know, about all those things and. And because I also know you can't practice a lot in that space because you need to have some sort of infrastructure to, um, you know, to play around with, to learn in, as opposed to like software engineering or programming and stuff like that. But I'll say go online, find people who are doing these things, try to intern with them, try to just volunteer your time and learn what they do. And I think that's a good way to start, I would say. Fair enough. Nick, do you have any sense of what's the future of security and what a young person should be like focused on if they're just getting started? Yeah, I mean, you, the first thing is that you've got to enjoy it, right? If, if you're interested in security, it's such a uh, area. Yeah, I know, it's a broad question. Uh, uh, yeah, but you kind of, depend on where you want to go and, and you guys are laugh, right? Because we go down an audit route, we go down a compliance route, we go down a risk route and people find it boring. Um, I like technology security is kind of where my forte is. So find something you, you like, find something that interests you. Um, but in terms of actually getting a trash, I think there, there are so many different um, enterprise, um, uh, what do we call them? Apprenticeships that can, that can be addressed and are taking on people le with learning experience. And it all depends on kind of where we want to drive it towards. So as long as you you find it interesting, you want to drive it, then just head straight in, dive in, learn, learn, read up. I when I came out of university, um, I did a degree in business management. I didn't know I was going to get into IT. I always knew that I liked IT, but I didn't know I was going to get into cybersecurity. But you take that that first step in, dip that toe in the water, and understand what you're really interested in. Um, but as um, as Daniel just alluded to, involved in the internet, there's so many hackathons that are out there. Get involved in that. That, that's interesting. Even I like doing that. And I'm not the most technically savvy person at all, uh, but it's good to learn. It's good to understand the coding element. It's good to understand it from a developer's perspective, people who are writing the code, people who are using the code, understanding the business outcome and the needs and the requirements. So find kind of your niche area and just go, go for it. Gotcha. I was, I was going to add, I was going to add, sorry, Tony, I was going to add, kind of a, put some libraries and try to hack into some systems. I think that's where it's start. <laughs> I'm not sure you think that's Daniel's bad advice. advice. <laughs> think that's Daniel's bad advice. advice. <laughs> I think you should take Daniel's advice with a lot of uh, salt. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay. All right. Let's see in here. Uh, Joseph, this is for you. So, um, I mean, it's a question I asked of a couple of other people. In recent times, both pre and post pandemic, what kind of cyber fraud? is United Capital sort of seeing and like having to defend for. Uh, what's on the rise, actually? So yeah, what kinds are on the rise? Joseph? Um, so, okay, what, what I'll say is this, um, pre and post, for us particularly, it's been more or less the same kind, it's just spiked a whole lot. Um, we've not had more or less um, cybersecurity um, issues as it were, that actually impacted us directly. But what we are seeing is that we are having a whole lot of it impact people would otherwise have them prospective customers, right? So if you did go on Facebook um, back a year ago, we had um, people trying to run the whole identity theft thing. So you could find my group CEO, you, can, you could find three, four accounts of him, you could find five accounts of me, you could find... Um, each of my MDs, I have about five of them. You could find two, three accounts of them and people trying to use this um, account to cajole members of the public to say invest in X, Y, Z. So um, we, we actually started taking this app down and we, we even had to go all the way to get an Israeli company to take it down on, on a weekly basis. 
we take down up to 30 of these pages, 30 from just Facebook. Then we had them go all the way to Instagram. We had them go to WhatsApp. It was a bit difficult to take down the WhatsApp one, but finally we got our heads into it and we started taking them out, um, 10, about 10 a week. But for Instagram, it has- But WhatsApp, I can just change my name to, like I can change myself, my name- Yeah, so there are, there, are, there are APIs that you can use um, to do that. Um, like I said, we also have um, an Israeli consultant that also tries that. But for, for Telegram, it's been almost impossible. So one of the things we've seen is that um, as you continually take down the ones on Facebook um, and Instagram, those ones, the, the guys who create these things, as you're taking them down, you're seeing new ones pop up, right? So they've reduced, they don't go so much in that direction because they know you are taking them down real fast. But on the Telegram part, it's spiking. So that's one of the things we've realized post-pandemic. And there's almost no one to get to in Telegram to say, who is the full authority that we can say, okay, these things, these pages are spam pages, you need to take them down. And so when I sit daily, I get mails that says, oh, I've just been scammed X, Y, Z amount. I've just been scammed X, Y, Z amount. And most of these people, it's up until they've been scammed that they now come to the real United Capital to say, um, I just checked your site now. I just realized um, I paid into a personal one, a largest account. Or, and we've gone up to the point of even tracking down some of these people. And I guess say most of them are from a particular university. <laughs> Some went towards the south. It was from a particular university, and we had to track down a few of them. And at that point, um, after we got those um, cases in the police, we had a bit of a drop. Three, six months later, we started seeing a bit of a rise again. So that, for us, is one of the major ones. Um, um, identity theft, both for the organization as a whole and for the executives. Um, that's one of the ones we are facing. Save for that, most of the others we, we try to manage. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, guys, there's a poll that is on screen right now. If you can take a moment and help us fill it out. Uh, Muiwa is also going to put a survey in the chat group, which we'd appreciate. You are taking the time to fill so we know if this was useful and how valuable this session was for you. Um, I'm going to take, uh, we have a few more questions, but we are a bit tight on time. And so I'm just going to take sort of like final statements from everyone. Uh, Sophina, if I can ask you to leave, just any additional thoughts for the audience uh, on security blog? Sorry, on security what? Okay. Just any final comments for the audience from you? Oh, okay. Uh, well, my, so, the, so the leaders or people who are the CISOs and CISOs, the CIOs and CISOs, first of all, I think we shouldn't just feel relaxed and everything. The, the whole pandemic has happened and we don't know what other pandemic might happen five years from now or two years from now. Have your plans in place and be ready to like challenge those or be able to like build up different strategies for users who are here today and for other people who have been trying to get into cybersecurity space and everything. Learn as much as you can, be able to willing to explore as well as being able to beef up your own security. Don't just rely on the fact that, okay, yes, um, I have a good platform, so I, I don't have to do anything to protect myself. If you have to get an antivirus, get it. It doesn't even cost a lot, really. It's, some of them are free. Some are, are like very, 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 very minute and you can't afford them. Get as a password manager for yourself. You can't, you can't remember up to 100 passwords every single day. They are very affordable ones as well out there that you could have on your phone. And yeah, really just stay safe if you can and be good, be good citizens and developers, Daniel, engineers and CTOs, please build good products for us that we can use. And yeah, we believe. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Sophia. Thanks for joining us today. Daniel, final comments for the audience? Yeah, um, first, um, thank, you, thank you for the time and thank everyone for, for joining. I think it's just one word I mentioned earlier. As in terms, as a CTO or like a CIO, I think just be paranoid enough. And because I think a lot of things, like for instance, again, saving password in plain text, data security, some of things are just out of irresponsibility and laziness, honestly. Because sometimes it gets very difficult to have to do all of those things to keep people's information safe. But I think just be paranoid and say, what could go wrong? How could my business die if something goes? How could I be dragged into that if you know something like this happens very intense? You know, so just be paranoid about what could go wrong and try to cover all those loose ends. Um, in terms of uh, users and, and the general public, I'd say. Um, you know, use use very secure passwords also. Um, you know, use secure passwords. Don't repeat passwords as much as possible. I know that's also hard, but also you should be paranoid about your information on the platforms you use. Don't just sign up everywhere, right? If you're going to sign up everywhere to test out system, maybe you have a spare email or something. Don't just give out your information anyhow. 
Um, and yeah, just, just be careful. Don't click links, for instance, on your emails, the general things you know. Just, just be aware that there's a lot of trouble out there. It's like, if you're going through a war zone, you know that a bomb could drop on you. So think about the internet in some way like that. Um, and, and just, you know, before you take actions, think about it, I, I'd say. Yeah, I hope that helps. Um, if you take nothing else from Daniel, I think you should take be paranoid. As a final, as his final word, uh, Adeliwa, final words. Uh, thanks, everyone, and thanks for joining. Me. I'm just going to add to what uh, Daniel and Sophie have said. Um, apart from using strong password, most of these platforms today gives you the option to have some level of multi-factor. Uh, enable those on your internet accounts on any platform where it's available. Uh, where you can get authenticated for them on your phone. I know that's very, very important you do that. Uh, for the guys looking to get into security, it's just about the interest. Uh, the first thing is to be interested in it. I've got people in my team that are chartered accountants. I've got people that study the uh, human resources and all that. And today they're uh, security professionals. So don't think you're limited by the um, course you studied. It's all about interest. Go for it. And there's so many jobs out there for security personnel now. You can't go wrong. Um, it's not a good thing, but the bad guys are a step ahead of us. And we need um, as many people as possible in the ethical space and in the white hat space. So get into it. Uh, get involved. Have the interest, study hard, and the sky is your limit. Thank you. Thank you, Adir Lua. Joseph? Well, for me, I'll say security never sleeps. Okay. <laughs> you can't <laughs> sleep. If you try to sleep, it, it just goes ahead of you. For the young people, if you can get a mentor, someone that does what you want, what you want to achieve, someone that has made the mistakes, um, I would say get one. Get a mentor, get someone you can talk to every once in a while, just so that you don't make the mistakes they already made. Your own making of that mistake in today's world might just be too expensive, right? Security never sleeps. Keep that in mind. Try not to slow down. Keep. Thank you, Joseph. There's a friend of mine named Nuji who does security and uh, tech at Flutterwave. Um, who I had hoped to have here today, but couldn't join us. Um, she talked about like just sleeping with her laptop behind it, beside her permanently, just like <laughs> just at any time of the day, like, how do we solve this day? Like just anyway, um, I guess that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's security. Uh, Nick, last, but certainly not least. Yeah, no, I think if, the, if there's one thing that I would probably take away from this is, um, the, the user is key, right? We've all talked about it when we talk about cyber fraud, whether it's, I didn't, I didn't, to be perfectly clear about this, to in alignment with what Safina said, don't rely on them, help them. Be perfectly clear about that, help them, give them the right tools so they don't have to make the decision. They just maybe have to authenticate and have, uh, include them in that authentication process. Understand the user, because ultimately when we talk around cyber fraud, cyber fraud is typically done on a malicious intent, not always, but typically on a malicious intent. So we need to understand the user and the people who got that access and, and that diligence and that technical um, expertise and that know-how to be able to go about that. And at the same time, for the people who aren't malicious, that sometimes it's just in, unintentional mistakes, help them. They're the key ones that we do need to help. So user is key. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nick, and thank you for joining us today, everybody. Um, so uh, our next event, uh, yeah, our next event holds on June 4th, 2021. I believe that Muyo has dropped the link to that event in the chat. And I think I'm gonna ask him to drop it again. Please register. Um, it should be super interesting. Uh, we do try to keep these things uh, varied and uh, diving deep into various areas of the tech space. Um, and then, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ava Security and Urban Ubuntu uh, for supporting this event. Uh, Nick for joining us, uh, speaking on behalf of Ava. Um, Muyo has dropped uh, a link to uh, Ava Security's reveal demo in the panel, uh, in the chat. So if you wanna uh, take a look at that, please click the link. Uh, but thank you again for your support. 
uh, Ava Security and Urban Ubuntu. Uh, if you don't know TC Insights, it is our data research unit at Tech Cabal. Uh, you can visit our websites to get some of the reports that we've already put out, or you can uh, request custom research or a custom report. Uh, we're happy to work in partnership with uh, people, and we do a lot of work for big tech companies, for our uh, investors, um, and a wide range of people within the system. Um, and uh, last but not least, if you're not already signed up for the Tech About Daily Newsletter, I do not know why. Please, please, please go sign up. It's a daily uh, recap of all things interesting in technology across the continent. Uh, get the tech news that matters uh, first thing in the morning in your inbox. Uh, the links on the the links on there bit.ly slash tech about daily. Um, and once again, thank you everybody so much for joining us today. I hope it's been valuable. I hope it's been interesting. Uh, my name is Tamiwa. I'm the CEO of the Big Cabal Media. Um, and I and the entire Tech Cabal team, thank you all, uh, the speakers for joining us and the audience for being with us today. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful weekend. God bless you all.